Look in your Bibles there, if you will, please. Numbers chapter 32, beginning in verse 1. The Reubenites and Gadites had a very large number of livestock. When they surveyed the lands of Jaser and Gilead, they saw that the region was a good one for livestock. So the Gadites and Reubenites came to Moses, Eliezer the priest, and the leaders of the community and said, The territory of Atroth, Dabon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshron, Elah, Saban, Nebo, and beyond, which the Lord struck down before the community of Israel, is a good land for livestock, and your servants own livestock. They said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Don't make us cross the Jordan. But Moses asked the Gadites and Reubenites, Should your brothers go to war while you stay here? Why are you discouraging the Israelites from crossing into the land the Lord has given them? That's what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. After they went up as far as the Ekon Valley and saw the land, they discouraged the Israelites from entering the land the Lord had given them. So the Lord's anger burned that day and He swore an oath because they did not follow me completely. None of the men 20 years old or more who came up from Egypt will see the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. None except Caleb, son of Jethnani, and the Kenzanite, and Joshua, son of Nun, because they did not follow the Lord completely. Uh, because they did follow the Lord completely. The Lord's anger burned against Israel and He made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until the whole congregation that had done what was evil in the Lord's sight was gone. And here you, a brood of vipers, stand in your father's place, adding even more to the Lord's burning anger against Israel. If you turn back from following him, he will once again leave this people in the wilderness, and you will destroy all of them. Then they approached him and said, We want to build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our dependents, but we will arm ourselves and be ready to go ahead of the Israelites until we have brought them into their place. Meanwhile, our dependents will remain in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until each of the Israelites has taken possession of his inheritance. Yet we will not have an inheritance with them across the Jordan and beyond because our inheritance will be across the Jordan to the east. So Moses replied to them, If you do this, if you arm yourselves for battle before the Lord and every one of your armed men cross the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies from his presence and the land is subdued before the Lord, afterward you may return and be free from obligation to the Lord and Israel. And this land will belong to you as possession before the Lord. But if you don't do this, you will certainly sin against the Lord and be sure your sin will catch up with you. One time before. Forty years earlier, the Israelites had come to the banks of the Jordan River. And Moses had sent spies into the land, twelve of them to spy out the land, to, to see what they needed to do to conquer it, to overcome the land. And the spies went in and they looked it over and they came back and gave a report. And they said, surely it is a, a land flowing with milk and honey. Everything that God has promised us about this land is true. The crops are, in, are enormous. There are streams and wells. There is water in abundance. It is a fruitful and a beautiful land. But ten of those who came back said there are giants in the land. And we saw ourselves as grasshoppers in their sight. There is no way we can go in and conquer this land. Joshua and Caleb said, no, come on. Come on, the Lord's with us. Look at all He's done. Let's go in. But the ten dissuaded the multitudes. And so they, in terror, turned away from the Jordan River. The Lord said, okay. Y'all won't listen to me. You won't do what I've told you to do. None of you, 20 years old or older, are going to live to go into the promised land. Now wander in the wilderness. The next day, some of the people, realizing that God was ticked, decided that they were going to try to do an invasion anyway, but it was a day late and a dollar short. When God tells you to do something, you got to do it when He tells you. Because He won't often give you a second chance. So for 40 years, they wandered the wilderness until all of those who refused to go in that day died. And their sun-bleached bones covered the wilderness. And here they are again standing on the banks of the Jordan River looking over into the promised land once again 
And there were two and a half tribes of the Israelites not that did not want to go in, not out of fear, not out of concern that they could not be victorious because they had seen God give them victory time and time again. No, that was not their problem. The problem was they had become too comfortable in the world. And they began to look around and they saw the grass and they saw the streams. They saw the beautiful environment, the area around where they already were and they said, we don't want to go into the promised land. We're happy, we're content, we're comfortable with where we are. Don't make us go in there. Moses said, boys, what in the world is the matter with you? Your ancestors did this 40 years before and all of them died and you're going to do it again? They said, no, 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 no. You got us wrong. We'll go in, we'll fight, we'll do what the Lord wants us to do, but, but don't make us stay there. We'll go in and we'll fight for the other Israelites until all of them get their land and then we'll come back and we'll live on this side of the Jordan. Moses said, you do what you have promised to do and you'll be free from your obligation." But be certain that if you do not follow through with what you've said you will do, that your sin will find you out. One of the hardest things to do after we are saved is to persevere or to continue in the faith without being detoured by the devil. For the devil sets a lot of detours, gives us a lot of opportunities, a lot of other possibilities. He gives us a lot of other things we can do instead of pursuing what God has called us to do. Instead of becoming what God has called us to become. Instead of accomplishing what God has promised to accomplish through us. We get distracted. Many people said, don't, don't make us go in there and do that. Most said, okay, if you follow through with what you've said, it'll be alright. But if not, be sure that your sin will follow you. Your sin will catch up with you. You see, God expects all of us to do our part. Our part may be different than our neighbors, but all of us have a part to do in overcoming the land. All of us have a role to play. In other words, Moses warned them if they, that if they did not go and help their brothers defeat the enemy that they were committing a great sin and that God would deal with that sin. Now wait a minute. He said, your sin. Was he talking about the sin of adultery? No. Was he talking about the sin of drunkenness or, or gluttony or theft? Any of those things? No. He's talking about the sin of not doing what God has called you to do. The sin of not keeping your word. The Bible is clear and has given us illustration after illustration that we must do what God has called us to do. And if we don't, be sure our sin will find us out. If we were to walk through the pages of the Bible, we could take testimonies from many people. For instance, we come now to a couple kneeling beside a fresh grave. In that grave, they had just covered the body of their son. His name was Abel. Cain, their other son, had killed his brother. Now mom and dad have had to take the body of that son Abel, that cold, lifeless body, and place it in a cold, dark grave. God had given Adam and Eve a command. You can eat from any tree of the garden, but from this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not touch it. That had been many years before. They had already faced God over that. They have already said, God, I'm sorry. And God had made a covering for their nakedness and clothed them in His righteousness because they had forsaken their own. Many years before they had done that, surely it's all in the past, never to face it again. But as Adam and Eve put that son in the grave, they died with him. And remember that this sin is due to their sin. How many times do you think Adam and Eve died inside when they passed that grave? How many times do you think they shed tears? 
one would go walking by and find the other standing by that grief weeping how much do you think their hearts were broken when they covered up that lifeless body they'd never seen death before and it was like covering themselves their own dreams and their own lives their son was dead hey Adam can you play with sin Adam would scream his answer to you no be sure your sin will find you out oh just a few pages further in the Bible we find a man with his face buried in his hands there are two small children playing beside him there is a cave behind him there are two young girls there the man has his face buried in his hands he raises up and looks down across the plain he looks down across the rubble where there used to be a great city a great people he looks down there and he weeps and he wails his name is Lot he wanted the world and the things of the world he thought that he could move into the city of sin he thought that he could give up his standards he thought he could let his children make their own decisions about life he thought he could go his own way and dabble in sin and enjoy a little play in the world and listen to him now as he talks to us about his children he would call their names as he looked at the rubble of the city and the rubble of the cities remind him of the rubble of his life he would think about his wife and how they were both once joyfully serving God with God's people and yet how they chose the worldly lifestyle of Sodom and how she was turned into a pillar of salt oh how he wishes he could go back and do things differently he'd think about how he would never know her again never see her again he would think of his two daughters that did escape with him and we ask him Lot are these your grandchildren he shakes his head no those are your daughters he shakes his head yes we say wait Lot I I don't understand those are not my grandchildren they're my children you see my two daughters accustomed to living in the world with my compromising standards and compromising lifestyle decided that they wanted the things that the world had and so when we escaped that city and the men who were to be their husbands were destroyed my daughters decided they wanted families and children of their own so unbeknownst to me they got me drunk and both of my daughters slept with me these that should be my grandchildren are my children a man that had the favor of God upon him a man whose riches were given to him because he associated with God's friend but now he is sitting outside that cave in poverty and in shame looking at two children given to him by his own daughters he's looking at his ruined life and we ask him Lot can you play with sin and he would scream with despair and anguish no oh it'll cost you too much a few pages further on we see the greatest leader who's ever lived standing there he's looking over into the promised land the beautiful land and he weeps he looks down from that mountain and he sees the people that he loved more than he loved his own life he once stood before God and said if you take them God you'll have to take me also and so because of his love for those people God spared them I know I've sinned but I love them 
You see the great Moses as he weeps. He says, these are my people. I cared for them in the wilderness. Those children, I was there when they were born. I counseled them. I counseled their parents. I should be there with them. I should be going to the promised land with them. I gave God my life. I gave Him everything. I promised the Lord that I'd serve Him. I went up to the mountain with God. He met with me there. He gave me His commandments etched in stone with His very own fingers. I met Him face to face. I ought to be there with them. But you see, one day I disobeyed God. I lost my temper. I was told to speak to the rock, but in my anger I struck it like I had done before. I disobeyed God's command and now I'll never see the promised land. I'm talking about Moses who walked with God. Who handled the very words of God etched on tablets of stone. I'm talking about Moses who knew God face like no other man who had ever lived. Moses lost his temper one time and he said because of that I'll never see the promised land. You sit here and say well I don't believe this sin is bad enough. I don't believe I've done anything all that wrong. It's not that bad that I miss church a lot. It's not that bad that I don't tithe or pray or witness or read my Bible. God said that any sin that disobeys Him, any act that disobeys Him is a sin great enough. Ask Moses. Moses, can you get away with compromise? Can you get away with sin? Compr Moses would answer, even have a life, after a life of walking with God, you can compromise in the end and destroy it all. We see a giant of a man grinding in a Philistine mill. His name is Samson. He was physically the strongest man who has ever lived. He was the heartthrob of every woman in his day. Samson sinned and paid the price by losing his eyes and therefore was of no more use to God. Samson, what was your sin? I believe he'd say, I didn't listen to my father. I didn't listen to the teachings of my father when he warned me to leave those women alone. When he warned me about my lifestyle, I didn't listen to my daddy. And now I'm blind. I have no future. I have nothing left to look forward to. My sin has found me out. And yours will as well. Oh, it may take 5, 10, 20, 40 years. But God doesn't take sin lightly. We'll see another man. He stands head and shoulders above every other man in the nation. He's a giant himself. He's the most handsome man in the whole kingdom. But now we see him propped up between heaven and earth with his own sword. The blade is sticking through him. He's taking his own life. His name is Saul. And why did he die like that? Because of his sin, his pride, and his disobedience. Why was he cursed of God? Because he tried to change the way that God said he was to do things. He tried to do things his own way. He tried to sacrifice to God instead of obeying God. God said, Saul, obeying me is better than sacrifice and to hearken than to the fat of rams. Saul said, no, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to rebel against what you say and do my own thing and live my own life and do what I want to do. And now look at him on the battlefield. Saul, Saul, you giant of a man. A man that God first intended to stand against that giant Goliath. Saul, why are you dying on the battlefield? From your own sword. 
is because I chose to do things my own way instead of the way God told me. Now we go to the city of Jerusalem. We enter the palace. There's an elderly king who walks about with his arms outstretched weeping. Oh, Absalom. Absalom, my son, Absalom. Oh, to God that I had died in your place. I'm sorry, Absalom. I'm sorry. His name is David. David, what happened? You know what David would say? He'd say, be sure that your sin will find you out. You go to the palace, it'll find you there. You go to the battlefield, it will find you there. You go anywhere you want to go, your sin like a hound out of hell is stalking you. The only hope for you and I is to fall upon our faces before the Lord Jesus Christ and ask for mercy. To ask for forgiveness. I'm saying to you right now that if God lets Christians today get away with their fooling around and their idolatry and their lust and their God robbery, their disobedience and indifference, their unconcern and their coldness of heart, then he's going to have to resurrect Adam and Eve, Moses, Lot, Samson and David and apologize to every one of them. God did not let them get away with their sin. And he's not going to smile and wink at ours. And act as though there's nothing to it. Moses says to them, Be sure if you do not do this, your sin will find you out. Now I know right now some of you are thinking to yourself, I don't have anything like that in my life. I don't have any unconfessed sin in my life. I love and serve the Lord Gene. This passage, this account, and this sermon doesn't apply to me. It has nothing to do with my life at all. You may be right. But there's something else I'd like you to notice about these folks. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 1. The Reubenites, the Gadites, had a very large number of livestock. And when they surveyed the lands of Jaser and Gilead, they saw that the region was a good one for livestock. So the Gadites and Reubenites came to Moses, the leaders of the priest and the leaders of the community, and said, The territory of Atroth, Didon, Jazor, Nimron, Heshbon, Elah, Sebon, Nebo, and beyond, which the Lord struck down before the community of Israel, is good land for livestock and your servants own livestock. They said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Don't make us cross the Jordan. Now what was God's plan for these people in the first place? When he brought them out of Egypt, what did he tell them? He said, I'm going to take you into a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to make you a nation of priests. I'm going to make you a city on a hill. I'm going to use y'all to make a difference in the world. I'm going to separate you from the rest of the world spiritually. I'm going to separate you from the rest of the world geographically. I'm going to make you different and separate and distinct. And everybody in the world is going to know that you are different and that you are my children. Because I have a plan and a purpose for you. Go into the promised land. And I will bless you. And I will use you. And here they are. On the very outskirts of the promised land. On the very border of the homeland that the Lord has promised them. Looking over the river into a land flowing with milk and honey. But do they notice that? No. No. They look at what's around them. And they see the grassland. And they see the pastures. And they see the rivers. And they say, we don't want to go over there. We don't want to go all the way. 
This is close enough. What a terrible decision that was. To not fulfill God's plan for their lives. And oh, how it cost them. It cost them in many ways. First, it cost them spiritually. In Joshua chapter 22, we read that they built for themselves a memorial altar. You see, since they were not in the promised land, since they were not in the place where the tabernacle was erected and later the temple was built, since they had not crossed the river, going to church and going to the temple was too far for them. We don't want to go to that extent to worship. We don't want to have to go that great distance to worship. Even though God said that's where we're to make our sacrifices, even though He said that's where we're to gather together, this place is good enough. And so they erected for themselves a memorial altar on their side of the river. And they never were again as close to the Lord as they were before. And how sad it is that there are so many Christians today who instead of pursuing, the God, pursuing God and passionately following Him, they erect for themselves memorials to take the place of the worship that is due God. Oh, you'll find them. They may have a Bible or two on the shelf in the house. They may even wear cross earrings or a cross necklace. And they will refer to themselves as spiritual but not religious. And there's a separation and a difference. A barrier between them and the Lord that need not exist. Oh, perhaps sometime in the past they made a decision for Christ. Perhaps they were baptized. Perhaps even they attended church for a while. But somewhere along the way they decided it was too far, too, too distant, too much trouble to get up and go and gather with other believers. And so there's a spiritual separation and their passion and their love for the Lord becomes lukewarm. They build a memorial. But not only did, did, were they separated spiritually, but because of that separation, they lost sight of God's will for their lives. God did not call them to be shepherds and herdsmen and ranchers. That may be how they made their living. That may be how they put food on the table. That might have been their job or their career, but that is not what God called them to. That was only their livelihood. God called them to be a separate and distinct people. And because they stopped from going where God wanted them to go, they took their eyes off of what God had called them to do and instead settled for making a living. They lost sight of what God had called them to do and who He had called them to be. And sadly, there are many people in our country today who profess to be Christians and sadly some even in this church perhaps who have lost sight of what God has called them to be and who He has called them to be and what He has called them to do. They've taken their eyes off the fact that they are to be salt and light in the world, that they are to live different and to be different and to act different and to talk different. And to share with the world that Jesus Christ is coming again, that they are to be ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. And instead they think of themselves as, as roofers. As farmers. No, 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 no. We are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is only how we make a living. They build a memorial and were separated from God. They lost sight of God's will for their lives. Instead of possessing the land, the land possessed them. Because of their compromise, they were the first to fall militarily. And the nation of Israel turned its back on God. And he allowed other countries to invade the area. For several generations, this people on this side of the river were the first conquered and occupied. Because of their compromise. And as a matter of fact, by the time of Jesus, in this area they were raising pigs. 
the Gadarene demoniac was living in this area all through the pages of the Bible we find the Lord encouraging us to go forward to step out of the boat to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ to become more and more transformed into the image of Christ so that we can reflect His glory more and more to the world and yet because of grandparents spiritual compromise their children were paying a price generations later because their parents quit passionately pursuing God desiring to do and to be what God wanted them to do and to be when they, because they decided this is good enough their children and their grandchildren and their great grandchildren paid a price oh they might not have been around to see it but their children paid a price how in the world can we expect our children to passionately pursue God and the things of the Lord if we are not pursuing them ourselves how in the world can we look for God's hand of blessing upon their lives if we have sat down and said this is good enough if we are not striving to learn more about the Lord to grow closer to Him to move the halls of heaven with our prayers how in the world can we expect our children to be more passionate about the things of God than we are if they see no passion in our lives let me ask you have you sat down have you quit are you walking closer to the Lord today than you were a year ago I have no idea where you are in your walk with the Lord this morning. But let me ask you. Have you sat down on the wrong side of the river? Or are you still passionately pursuing the Lord with all of your might? Striving to be that man, that woman of God. Striving to grow more and more into the likeness of Christ. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't settle for good enough when you can make a difference.